ambassadors, site commissioners and other members of the diplomatic community, members of the university executive and senior management, particularly Professor Delaray, deans of faculties, I've seen quite a few deans present here this evening, guests of Professor James Obude, University of Pretoria colleagues and colleagues from other universities, all other guests of the University of Pretoria, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this evening's expert lecture on behalf of Professor, the Vice-Chancellor and Principal of the University of Pretoria, Professor Cheryl de la Rey. Unfortunately, Professor de la Rey had been invited to speak in Parliament this morning and she alerted me yesterday that I was going to stand in for her. She has just arrived, but seeing that she's out of breath, I will continue the welcome and, and host you on her behalf. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, just a word on the UP Expert Lecture Series. The University of Pretoria Expert Lecture Series was initiated by the Vice Chancellor and Principal to provide a platform for academics at the University of Pretoria to provide lectures on critical or topical issues that are of interest to their peers as well as a broader audience. Professor De La Rey is a host and sponsor of each of the UP Expert Lectures. This evening's Expert Lecture, ladies and gentlemen, will be provided by Professor James Obidikude, as indicated on the program. And now I will give you a brief introduction, a brief bias sketch of Professor James Obude. Professor James Obude is a research fellow attached to the Center for the Advancement of Scholarship at the University of Pretoria. Professor Obude took up this position at the beginning of May 2013. He currently also serves as a Deputy Director of the Center for Advancement of Scholarship. Until his recent appointment at the University of Pretoria, James Ogude held the position of Professor of African Literature and Cultures in the School of Literature and Language Studies at the University of the Witwatersrand. <coughs> Professor Ogude had worked at the University of the Witwatersrand since 1994. In other words, he worked there for approximately 20 years. During the course of his tenure at the University of the Witwatersrand, he for a considerable period of time served as the head of African Literature and as the Assistant Dean responsible for research in the Faculty of Humanities. Professor Ogude had obtained his MA and BA honours at the University of Nairobi and his PhD at the University of the Witwatersrand. In addition to serving as a board member of leading international journals such as the Journal of Commonwealth Literature, Professor Ogude is also a board member of the National English Literary Museum of South Africa and he is one of its former chairs. Professor Ogude is also a member of the National Research Foundation Specialist Committee for Literary Studies, Languages and Linguistics. Prof Professor Ogude is the author of the monograph Ngukes, Novels and African History, Narrating the, the Nation. He has also co-edited a total of four books and one anthology of African stories. Professor Ogude has published numerous articles in peer-reviewed journals in the areas of African literature and popular culture in Africa. One of the very few NRF rated scholars in African literature, Professor Ogude holds a, an NRF B rating. James' research interests include the post-colonial experience in Africa. More recently, his research focus has shifted to popular cultures and literature in Africa with a special focus on African urban and city identities. He is also working on black intellectual traditions. Professor Ogude is a principal, uh, Ogude is a principal that Director investigator of a University of Pretoria research project on the African philosophy of Ubuntu. This project is largely funded by the Templeton World Charity Foundation. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now my pleasure to invite Professor Ogude to present his expert lecture titled, very intriguingly, Great Expectations and the Morning After, a Literary Anatomy of Post-Independence Politics in South Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, we welcome Professor Ogude to the podium. Um, thank you, Professor Norman, for those um, wonderful words. Um, it's my privilege um, uh, to take part in this expert lecture series. Um, Professor De La Rey, the Vice Chancellor of the University of Pretoria, I think you've created a wonderful forum, a, a forum that gives us a chance to bridge that gap uh, between uh, the intellectuals and the rest of the public out there. And that's why when I was approached to give uh, this lecture, 
uh, I took it you know, fairly seriously because rarely do we get a chance uh, to engage uh, with the public. The construction of scholarship has always been about publishing in specialized journals, journals that sometimes are far removed from um, um, you know, the broad public you know, that we are expected to engage with from occasion to, you know, from time to time. I want to thank also the diplomats that are here that are attending uh, this, um, um, this, 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 this lecture. Uh, I welcome you. I want to thank my colleagues who have uh, joined us here also, my former students. I can see some of them around. And also uh, my family members uh, who are here. Some of them may be on their way. Now, when I was approached by um, Dr. Den uh, you know, uh, Dr. Denver, um, having talked to the VC about the expert lecture series, I was told that I needed to speak to the theme of celebrating 20, 20 years of democracy in South Africa. And that was extremely challenging for me. Challenging because I'm not an expert in Southern Africa or South Africa. I'm generally an expert of East African literatures and West African literature. That is my area. And so I thought, what do I do? How do you celebrate 20 years of democracy? And as I looked back, I decided that sometimes we celebrate too much on this continent. I see my ambassador, the Kenyan ambassador here, want to acknowledge you. So I decided that sometimes we celebrate too much on the continent and that there's need for us occasionally just to step back, to step back and take stock, to step back and ask ourselves what have we achieved over the years. It is often a lot easier to, to, build on achieve, uh, uh, to build on achievements, on the positive elements, but it's a lot more difficult, basically, to deal with the rot. And so today, when and if my lecture focuses on the rotten underbelly of the postcolonial state, you will forgive me. It is not because an, I'm an Afro-pessimist. It is not because I don't believe that Africa can do better, but it is precisely because I believe that one way of moving forward as a continent is to engage with some of the problems, the daunting problems that affect us as a continent. And these problems, I know South Africans find it very difficult to learn from the rest of the continent. Uh, and, and, and occasionally think that, you know, they're part of the first world. So what can we learn, as they say, from Africa? often giving the impression that they are not part of Africa. But I think even if, even if Africa, the rest of Africa has nothing to offer, I think it is important that we realize that we can learn from the mistakes that Africa itself made so that we don't falter. The title of my talk, therefore, is Great Expectations and the morning after a literary anatomy of post-independence politics in Africa. A title that I borrow in part from Neil Lazarus, that South Afri fine South African critic, but also a title that he himself draws from Charles Dickens' classic text, Great Expectations, that text that speaks to anticipation and the elusiveness of that expectation. That's what I want to speak to today.
the performance of African, lit of African countries more than four decades after attainment of independence continue to remain under scrutiny. Hunger, political strife, and limitations on civil liberties have continued unabated. And in spite of much vaunted talk about the remarkable increase in economic growth on the continent, many observers have concluded, sadly, that African independence has been an abysmal failure. This harsh assessment has not been limited to external agencies and foreigners, many of whom can be accused of having some hidden historical agenda against the continent. Indeed, many local players and general evaluations and appraisals of the economic, social, and political performance of African countries have tended to provide evidence of stagnation, general cor corruption in the public sector, making it impossible to create a conducive climate for unhindered economic growth and prudent use of public resources. In the political arena, there continues to be a proliferation of authoritarian regimes, civil strife, and sporadic military coups, the end result of which has been erosion of civil liberties, even among those who claim to be acting in the name of the people, while in fact their open agenda is to maintain themselves in power. This suppression of political dissent has led to a creation of a perversive culture of political patronage and cronism. I'm aware that one is generalizing here, and I'm also aware of the dangers of slipping into Afro-pessimism and failing to give credit to some of the remarkable advances that have been made on this continent. And yet, it is still important to pause and take stock to determine where the rain began to beat us, where we lost the initiative, as the Nigerian writer Chinua Chebe often reminded us. But the moment of ex great expectation and celebration that I signal in the title of my paper is best captured in the inaugural speeches of the founding fathers of the African nations at the moment of independence. I want us to turn to two examples to understand this moment of celebration. I want us to turn to Nkrumah's speech and Nelson Mandela's speech, basically to come to terms with what I'm talking about. First of all, Kwame Nkrumah's speech, I speak for freedom, a statement of African ideology from where this quotation comes from. Kwame writes, at long last the battle has ended, and thus Ghana, your beloved country, is free forever. And here again, I want to take the opportunity to thank the chiefs and the people of this country, the youth, the farmers, the women, who have so noble fought and won this battle. And I want to thank the valiant ex-servicemen who have cooperated with me in this mighty task of freeing our country from foreign rule and imperialism. From now on, we are no more a colonial but a free and independent people. We are not waiting. We shall no more go back to sleep. Today, from now on, there's a new African in the world, and that new African is ready to fight his own battle and show that, after all, the black man is capable of managing his own affairs. We are going to demonstrate to the world, to the other nations, young as we are, that we are prepared to lay our own foundation. That is Nkrumah. Let's listen to what Nelson Mandela also says. Strikingly, very close, strikingly, very similar. Today, all of us do, by our presence here, confer glory and hope to newborn liberty out of the experience of an extraordinary human disaster that lasted too long, must be born a society of which all humanity will be proud. We who were outlaws not so long ago have today been given the rare privilege to be host to the nations of the world on our own soil. 
we thank all our distinguished international guests for having come to take possession with the people of our country of what is, after all, a common victory for justice, for peace, for human dignity. We have at last achieved our political emancipation. We pledge ourselves to liberate all our people from continuing bondage of poverty, deprivation, suffering, gender, and other discrimination. Mark those qualifiers that come from Mandela. We don't find it in Nkrumah. Never, never, and never again shall it be that this beautiful land will again experience the oppression of one another by another. The sun shall never set on so glorious a human achievement. Let freedom reign. God bless Africa. Throughout the continent, similar speeches have been made echoing similar sentiments and a great sense of optimism that the moment of independence had conferred on the people of Africa. Whether we are thinking of Guinea in 1958 or Nigeria in 1960, Uganda in 1962 or Kenya in 1963, the ceremonies of independence and the speeches of the founding fathers of these nations resemble the triumph, that sense of optimism and celebration that marked Ghana's independence celebrations before them. The mood of ecstatic joy was not simply displayed by the leadership. It also animated the entire population. Given how protracted and bloody some of our struggles towards independence were, the moment of independence was a true watershed, a moment to celebrate, but also a moment to reimagine a new nation and its many possible futures. There was no doubt in the minds of many that these many possible futures pointed to a future of promise, even when that promise remained elusive. A character called Teacher in Amas, the beautiful ones are not yet born, talks about this promise. And he observes, talking about Ghana's independence, and I quote, we were ready here for big and beautiful things. The promise was so beautiful, even those who were too young to understand it all knew that at last something good was being born. It was there. We were not deceived about that. In the end, Amas' character poses a question. How could such a thing turn so completely into the other thing? How could so much promise this beautiful thing turn into despair. One of the things that Ama sets out to do in his novel is to understand the source and the reasons for this dreadful betrayal. The collapse, what I call the collapse of the contract between the rulers and the ruled. To examine the reasons for this compromise. How do we account for the swiftness with which the dreams of our people exploded overnight. How did hope turn into promise and promise into despair? What do we tell our people when they, again, like the character called teacher in Amas novel, says of one of the comrades, and I quote, he lives in a way that is far more painful to see than the way white men have always lived here. There is no difference then, no difference at all between the white men and their apes. The lawyers and the merchants are now these apes of apes, our party men, end of quote. I want us to watch a masquerade of songs that we have seen
as we watch, South Africa has witnessed what I call a masquerade of dancers. Chinua Chepe tells us that when you want to understand the masquerade, you must move with it. And often I wonder whether we move with the masquerade. Those people that dance and move on. And I'm trying to suggest that since independence, there's a sense in which we have witnessed forms of masquerade, forms of dancing. I failed to get the Mbeki clip. Those of you will remember when he was dancing to Brenda's song, um, Volindel, open the way, the ANC is coming. So another very important moment. And then, you know, President Zuma's song. Now my question, which I want you to think through, I don't want to make judgments. What do we make of different shades of dancing masquerades that we have witnessed here in a short history of democracy? Madeba dance, Becky dance, now Zuma dance, or simply those dancing on the margins of authority like Helen Zille or Malema. Are these signs being mistaken for wonders, as Homi Baba reminds us? Do we see them? Do we read them as sign or we look at them and think, oh, these are wonders? I think sometimes in this continent we think that way. Now, I want to try to respond to some of the issues that have been raising directly and indirectly uh, by turning to one of Africa's classical texts by the Ghanaian writer Aikwe Ama, who has attempted to examine the post-independence predicament, a revolution betrayed in our continent. Ama, the beautiful ones are not yet born, is important in two senses. First, it is a scathing critique of Nkrumah's Ghana, the first country in the sub-Saharan Africa to gain independence in 1957. Secondly, the novel is one of the very first to my mind, published in 1968, to draw attention to the depth of disillusionment that gripped Africa's first independent nation, a new nation which in the mind of young men like Ama had so much promise. Frederick Cooper, that American historian, has reminded us that, and I quote, African novelists were the first intellectuals to bring to the fore, to bring before a wide public inside and outside the African continent profound questions about the corruption within the post-colonial government and the extent to which external domination persisted." End of quote. Kufpa was of course referring, making reference to Amas, the beautiful ones are not yet born, and the Chebes, a man of the people, which he argues talks to masculine power in Africa in telling ways. The beautiful ones, like most of Amas early novels, focuses on the corruption, the political inertia, and economic stagnation of what it sees as an uncreative nationalist bourgeoisie whose prime role is protect the wealth of the former masters. A European prototype which it caricatures. It is a typical modernist African novel. It gives us a compelling picture of Nkrumah's Ghana through the filter screen, filter screen of the anonymous hero, simply known as the man. His anonymity speaks volumes about his marginalization as an alienated character, struggling on a daily basis to retain his integrity in a world defined by temptation. His wife, clamoring, after commodities that can only be brought about through corruption. The bribe offered him by traders at his place of work and taken by fellow clerks at the office where he works. And of course, the dishonest invitation by an influential family relation, a man called Kumson, the party man, who urges him to act as the front man in a fraudulent deal to purchase a luxurious boat. The politician's official facade of socialist politics prevents him 
from making a deal in his own name. We hear so many of those stories around us, people using front men to make deals because they, they do not want to be exposed. There is indeed a major paradox in the man's relationship with the filthy and decaying world around him. But despite, despite his passivity towards the seemingly permanent landscape, he tries to stand above it and its corrosive powers. There will be temptations for the man to dip into the murk and bring happiness to his loved ones, but his character is fixed, so much so that the reader is most certain that the good man will not give in to a myriad of temptations that come his way. We have here a story of a small man, honest, ordinary man, hounded like a criminal by corrupt men in a world propelled by crude materialistic principles. And yet we are also frightened by the honest man, not because of what he is or does. It is easier to sympathize with his actions because they are positive and guided by the purest ideals. But by his affirmation of the helplessness of those who stand for life, those who stand for love, those who stand for beauty. I will come back to this later. But what Amma points to in this novel is that there's a disturbing duality embedded in the body politic of the post-colonial state. And that is achieved through a consistent contrast between those characters who represent the ideals of beauty, love, and life, like the man and the teacher, and those who deliberately transgress such values, like the bus conductor and a character called Mr. Kumson, the party man. Now, the juxtaposition of good and evil has always been the stuff from which good art is crafted, especially when good triumphs over evil. And yet, Ama, in this novel, in an enigmatic way, refuses to go there and points to the solitude and a life of loneliness that the man of virtue must endure in a world where good is trampled upon. And although in the dramatic end to the text set against the 1966 coup that toppled Nkrumah, the man helps the fallen Kumson, the party man, now a fugitive in fear of his life, to escape by way of his latrine hall, the man himself remains cynical and uninterested in this crazy dance around him just because Nekroma has been toppled. This cynicism that characterizes the man is born of the sad knowledge. The sad knowledge that real change comes slowly and painfully. Pitted against the man is a world in which in spite of numerous claims of change, an historical movement has remained the same since the man was thrown in there. The fundamental question confronting a writer of a new nation groping for a moral compass and a spiritual matrix is how to get the root cause of this political malice. How do we deal with this kind of rot? In order to understand the root cause of post-independence grief, Ama forces us to confront what I call the rotten underbelly of his society. And that's how modern, modernist texts work. Modernist texts go for the rotten underbelly. Literature also works through subjectivity. We don't always give you a realistic picture as you think. We can go for the tragic and magnify it. We can go for the comic and magnify it. Modernist texts tend to go for the underbelly. And part of the reason why the modernist texts go for the, and the rotten underbelly of the society is to create what the Germans call a sense of estrangement, shock. Force you to confront a reality that you do not want to confront. Cartoonists do that a lot. For those of you who follow Shapiro, 
working through hyperbole, exaggeration, basically to shock you. That is precisely one of the things that Amma is doing in this, in this text. He draws our attention to the ruling elites a modest consumption of the country's resources without doing or producing anything in return and by anterior poetic logic contrast this to the mountains of dirt and excrement in the environment. The privileged consumer class which produces the waste also embezzle the municipal funds earmarked for its disposal resulting in litter bins overflowing with uncollected refuse. It is a case of history being seen here as the abetting of corruption in a cycle of consumption, waste, and disposal. Indeed, the imagery of the consumer, of, of consumer waste and excreta is accordingly pushed to the point of hyperbole and with purpose. And that is to surface the ruling elites, greedy consumption of power, privilege, and unproductive lifestyle. It is therefore no mere literary attempt to revel in filth for its own sake. Amma's point is that after a while, these obsessive metaphoric attributions that the readers might find so repulsive begin to invade, begin to possess, and become identified with their objects, providing, as Derek White writes, and I quote, the novel's oppressive political ethos with a matching totalitarian aesthetic and capturing the totalitarianness of word image concept control in single party states burdened with colonial legacies, end of quote. The language and imagery that Ama uses, us, uses force us to revise the familiar grammar of neocolonial values. It is not just some emotive association between corruption and dirt, or general analogy between moral and physical rot, but rather it is underpinned by an intricate and complex network of shock, shocking correspondences between human ingestion, evacuation cycle, the body politic, and the Ghanaian environment. In doing this, Amma seems to be mapping out the metaphoric labyrinth along which the course of political destiny of the post-colonial state is likely to follow. And I quote the narrow dimensions of the physiological circuit and a ritualized evacuation of the nation, end of quote, which must necessarily happen before any meaningful renewal or rebirth can take place. This ritualistic cleansing, this ritualistic evacuation of the nation to rid it of jumps of destruction that threaten its body politic from within and from without, as the Irish poet Yeats would have it, is a constant battle that has to be fought on a daily basis. It is it's a question of constantly reminding us ourselves of the founding values, the founding values that our founding fathers and mothers stood for. Whether you are thinking of, in our context, Lituli, Madiba, Lilian Goe, Helen Joseph, Sisulu, Biko, or Bran Fisher, the nation can only renew itself through this process of evacuation and going back to the values that our founding fathers and mothers stood for. Now, Ama, for those of you who know his works, is partly, beg your pardon, is partly influenced by the work of that great writer, you know, Franz Fanon, especially the pitfalls, the pitfalls of national consciousness. And what he does in this text is to draw our attention to the ideological bankruptcy, ideological bankruptcy of the nationalist elite and offering in the process a scathing critique of the irresponsibility of post-colonial leadership 
in Africa. And when I talk about the nationalist elite, I also include you and me. We are part of that. Sometimes we think we can only point fingers at the politicians. I believe it's not good enough. Even intellectuals have a responsibility in certain ways, you know, to deal with some of these things. In every position that we find ourselves, as Tony Bennett reminds us, whatever institutional structure within which you find yourself, you must play your part. It is not just, oh, leave it for the politicians. But of course, they bear the greater burden of responsibility. So like Fanon, Ama seeks to mock the parasitic style of the post-colonial leadership. Fanon's well-known argument is that, and, and which Ama takes up, is the assertion that the nationalist class that takes over power at independence lack originality of ideas. And they are a class of functionaries doomed to take lessons from their former oppressors. They were essentially undeveloped, having no real political autonomy nor economic power. Such a class would only bring about a few reforms at the top, but this will not affect the general populace in any real sense. Can you see B there? This class, Ama would argue after Fanon, is defined by their lack of creativity, their greed and conspicuous consumption, the evils that lead naturally to corruption and the pervasive culture of patronage and plunder of public resources. In such a context, rulers would abdicate their responsibility to the masses as they slide into a near compulsive material accumulation even as they get entrapped in what has come to be called the politics of the belly. In this novel, Ama also provides us with a graphic, a graphic representation of social and physical decay that comes to define the post-colonial uh, state. A decay that is sharply contrasted with affluence and opulence of the political elite, elite whose only mission in life is to accumulate wealth through corrupt tender practices. From the very beginning of the novel, Ama gives us this compelling and equally revolting decay that is gripping our new Ghana. To do this, Ama captures what I call the rotten underbelly of this society. And as one critic says, and I quote, through a skillful selection of incidents and objects, within a relatively few pages, the author establishes a social and physical world which is completely encased in death, in death and threatened by, by death. The railway corporation offices, the work environment of the protagonist, the man, is characterized by decay, rot, filth, materialist greed, corruption, bribery, all of which have become the defining features of this new nation. It is a world that is disturbingly reminiscent of that of the colonial order, a world in which the new seems to have taken after the old in such indecent haste as if the, the old had gone away, had not gone away at all. This is the picture the narrative voice gives us as we watch the man walking from the bus stop to his workplace. The GNTC, of course, was regarded as a new thing, but only the name had really changed with independence. The shop had always been there, and in old days, it had belonged to a rich Greek and was known by his name, A.G. Leventis. So in a way, the thing was new. Yet the stories that were sometimes heard about it were not stories of something young and vigorous, but the same old stories of money changing hands and throats getting moistened and palms getting greased. Only this time, if the stories aroused anger, there was nowhere for it to go. The sons of the nation were now in charge, after all. <laughs>
how completely the new thing took after the old. Does that sound familiar? Aurora Mines, Maricana, the decay and rot that ordinary people like the man find themselves in is a direct con consequence of the bankruptcy, but also the exhibitionist life that the political elite have taken to with haste. Mindless of how their own wealth is built on the ordinary people's poverty and squalor, they traverse the land with arrogance and pomp that surpasses their former masters. The ethic of conspicuous consumption is the one that Ama returns to every now and again to draw attention to how materialism, lust of wealth and power, become the hallmark of a neocolonial mentality driving the new men of substance in Africa. One of the painful things in the novel is that these new men of substance were until recently men of the people. Trade union leaders wearing red socks but smoking cigar. Communist leaders driving sports cars and asking people to turn to the left while they are driving to the right. In the teacher's estimation, Nekroma had been quite unique, rising from humble beginnings and showing, at least in his speeches, that he was in touch with the people's problems. Who could have guessed that such a resounding betrayal would follow? Through the character of the teacher, Ama seems to be suggesting that the spirit which Nikroma and many others like him, Kenyatta, Sekoture, among others, seemed to embody during the decolonizing years was subsequently betrayed once independence had been achieved. Having taken people to the mountain top, the leader abandons them there and in greed and haste begins to show his true color as Fanon reminds us. And I want to quote this at length to show you what Fanon, and I think how prophetic his quotation was. Fanon tells us, before independence, the leader generally embodies the aspirations of the people for independence and political liberty and national dignity. But as soon as independence is declared, far from embodying in concrete form the needs of the people in what touches bread, land and restoration of the country to the sacred hands of the people, the leader will reveal his inner purpose to become the general president of that company of profiteers impatient for their returns, which constitutes the national bourgeoisie." End of quote. This change in the politics of the leaders, his complicity in the betrayal of the people so soon after independence, is described by the teacher as the sort of movement and ideological shift that would make one sick. The teacher of serfs. Here we have a kind of movement that should make even good stomachs go sick. What is painful, what is painful to the thinking mind is not the movement itself, but the dizzying speed with which it, it happens. How horribly rapid everything has been from the days when men were not ashamed to talk of souls, of suffering, and of hope, to these days of low days, of smiles that will never again be sly enough to hide the knowledge of betrayal and deceit. There is something irresistible, and irres there is something of an irresistible horror in such quick decay. Ama, like many other African writers of his generation, such as Achebe, Ngugi, and Shoinka, single out the real source of this betrayal, the political corruption, and what he sees as consumer capitalism, which is mediated through images of consumption of food, eating, bodily decay, and defecation. Ama places a particular emphasis on consumption and waste as a continuing metaphor for the impact of cons consumer capitalism on Ghanaian society. The recurring analogy, one critic has argued, is between eating, temptation, desire, and corruption, and of necessity implies the inevitability of corruption. 
and yet it is really the perversiveness of corruption that creates the impression that it is inevitable. In real sense, it shouldn't. In much African literature, bribery and eating are fre frequently equated as is wealth and food. The corrupt and the wealthy are not merely well-fed, but they are grotesquely fat and flabby. Amas' description, the description of Kumson's double chin, his chubbiness, his inability to fit comfortably in the chair provided by the man, his flabby hands, all connect him to the previous rulers before him and after colonialism. As Amma comments, and I quote, and yet these were socialists of Africa, fat, perfumed, soft, with ancestral softness of chiefs who have sold their people and are celestially happy with the fruits of the trade, end of quote. The point that is being made is that the moral economy of the post-colony is measured through the material excess and utter deprivation, through opulence that marks the lives of the rich and the total lack that defines the life of the ordinary citizen. Apart from greed associated and associated images of consumption and corruption, <coughs> Ama also accounts for the collapse of the contract between the people and the ruled by drawing our attention in a very graphic sense to the ideology of materialism, which is best captured in the workings of what he calls the gleam, that which glitters. In a neocolonial society, Ama argues, the rich are not just contented with the sheer accumulation of wealth. They're not contented with that. In fact, instead, power and wealth must be performed. It has to be performed. You have to display it for you to be fully satisfied with it. And it has to be displayed through goods of ostentation. Wealth only accords one status when it can be demonstrated in a ritual of grotesque display. It must draw attention to itself. The metaphor is used to capture not simply the power of the gleam to entrap its victims, but also to capture the exhibitionist aspect of wealth. If Franz Fanon had speculated before independence about this consumerist and non-production uh, oriented ideology of the middle class, insisting that it was a result of a national bourgeoisie bereft of ideas because it lives for itself and cuts itself off from the people. Ama is unambiguous. He's showing that this has now become not simply a hegemonic ideology of the ruling elite, but one that has imprinted itself hegemo hegemonically upon society at large. It is a pervasive ideology that seems to affect both the ruled and the rulers. We are introduced to the gleam at a very early stage of the novel as we watch the man walking from, uh, to work very early in the morning, and I want us to capture that. On top of the hill, commanding it just as it commanded the scene below, its sheer flight, flat, multi-story side, an insulting white in the concentrated gleam of the hotel spotlights towered the useless structure of the Atlantic Caprice. Sometimes it seemed as if the huge building had been put there for a purpose, like that of attracting itself all the massive anger of a people in pain. But then, if there were any angry ones at all these days, they were most certainly feeling the loneliness of mourners at a festival, a festival of crazy joy. Perhaps then, the purpose of this white thing was to draw into its, onto itself the love of a people hungry for just something such as this. The gleam, in moments of honesty, had a power to produce a disturbing ambiguity within. It would be good to say the gleam never did attract. It would be good, but it would be far from the truth. <laughs> 
and something terrible was happening as time went on. It was getting harder and harder to tell whether the gleam repelled more than it attracted, attracted more than it repelled, or just did both at once in one disgustedly confused feeling all the time these heavy days. End of quote. Now the Hotel Atlantic Caprice is not just a tourist resort, but is also a venue where the new men of substance meet, like the Sheraton across here. It is the ultimate symbol of those who have succeeded or arrived in haste, as Ama would have it. Its gleaming spotlights is a reflection of its lawyer, its power to attract and observe, absorb the men and women of substance within its orbit. In its lawyer, it has the power to convince that it is real because, it, because its sparkle seems to promise splendor, power, prestige, and luxury. Within the context of massive poverty that the novel erects for us, the gleam is difficult to ignore. The preoccupation of the people from the timber clerk to the corporate bosses is to reach the gleam. As Neil Lazarus observes, and I quote, the society has become fetishistic in its obsession with ostentation and gratuitous consumption. Its rejection of all principles except those related to materialism and accumulation. In such a context, corruption is not only accepted as a fact of life, but actively endorsed as a way for social mobility. That is why the man's wife blames him for refusing to take bribes and tells him that he's acting like an onward Christian soldier. For the man, the problem is not simply about the desire for these things or wanting them. The problem, and I quote, is the way to arrive at them without is the way the problem is the way um, to arrive at them which brought confusion to the soul and everybody knew chances of finding a way that was not rotten from the beginning were always ridiculously small end of quote and as the band reminds us not even hard work could ever bring one closer to the gleam. He says, and I quote, there would always be one way for the young to reach the gleam. Cutting corners, eating the fruits of fraud, that has always been the way the gleam is approached. If one is able to amass in less than two decades the kind of wealth that took the Oppenheimer several years to accumulate, that cannot be attributed to hard work. So the pursuit of the gleam becomes the sole preoccupation of the general society. Integrity, honesty, and hard work seem to have been evacuated and society, uh, out of society and replaced by psychophancy and colors manipulation. What is captured in the novel is a society caught in a crazy dance of whiteness, where everyone from the government minister to the lowliest clerk imitates the manners, the European manners, and aspires to the grotesque Western middle class consumerism, privilege, and snobbery. It is worth noting, as one character in the novel observes, that the whiteness of the consumerist gleam is a filth-producing whiteness that has more rottenness in it than the slime at the bottom of the garbage dump. And Ama is quite scathing of what he sees as a parody of whiteness. I'm aware that because of the increasing prevalence of colorblind ideology and, of course, a flippant grammar of multiculturalism, it is a taboo these days to talk of whiteness. But Ama points, Ama's point is that a nuanced conceptual grasp of whiteness need not fall prey of focusing on whites only, but perhaps more importantly, on how whiteness plays itself out among those who have been subjected 
to its racial ideology over the years. It is for him how whiteness reproduces itself and becomes manifest among the colonized subjects through naked mimicry or apemanship of its ways that is more devastating that, than the actual social hierarchy that we have come to associate with, um, with it. Mimicry may have been sanitized by the Indian um, uh, scholar Homi Baba to signal a grammar and a sight of ambivalence and subversion, and therefore marking a radical rupture in colonial discourse. But for Ama, the conditions of in-betweenness and hybridity cannot be understood without reference to the ideological and institutional structures within which they are housed. In other words, like Fanon, Ama points to the fact that colonial authority works by inviting black subjects to mimic white culture and socializing them to believe the fantasy that whiteness represents goodness, beauty, and all that is non-threatening, thus producing a dislocated subject who are constantly being held into this culture through its institution, specifically underjudged by the logic of consumer capitalism with its twin warheads, materialism and individualism. For Ama then, a parody of whiteness and the entrapment within the orbit of the gleam is part of the paralysis of the African political elite. And yet, it is not as if they are not those who reject this hegemonic ideology of the gleam, this consumerist ideology. The novel shows that those with moral resolve and integrity can escape this cycle, albeit at a great price for them and their families. The man is confronted by rot and consumption, both at work and at home, but he rejects the ideology in, in spite of the fact that the loved ones hound him and make him feel guilty. The wife calls him a chichidodo. A chichidodo is a West African bird that hates shit but feeds on worms, forgive my language. Amas argument is that in a post-colonial state, the man of change, man and woman with integrity, will either be vilified, insulted, and face the possibility of what he refers to as internal exile, in, in, internal uh, exile. The man is vilified both by the loved ones and everyone else. He's being made to feel guilty for being honest. He says, and I quote, they make me feel like a criminal, the teacher, the other positive character is consigned to internal exile and a life of loneliness and isolation. Now the examples, the picture that I've painted may appear extreme and I'm aware that Ama, as I told you, is going for the rotten underbelly of the post-colonial state. But they're not atypical, they're not untrue. As I reflected, on these issues in relation to our own context in South Africa. I could not help but relate this to the experience of two important personalities whose drama have played themselves out in the public space. And theirs, may I add, may just be a tip of the iceberg in a context where similar men and women of integrity who are on the margins of society suffer silently. I was reminded of what Tuli Madonsela, the public protector, and our former head of the National Prosecuting Authority, Vusi Piccoli, have been subjected to for rejecting politics of compromise and corruption. While Tuli Madonsela still holds her position, we all know that she has been sitting under coal fire for a while now vilified and abused for fighting corruption and opposing some of the worst forms of excessive abuse of public resources, Madame Sella must sometimes feel like Amas protagonist whose life is defined by internal exile, loneliness, and a sense of guilt, especially when confronted by the loved ones. As I was writing this lecture, the Sunday Times of September 14 and 2014 wrote an interesting coverage on how 
Vusi uh, Piccoli was fired by a black empowerment firm called Zuzwe Nisaloba Gobodio. That's very authentic. Eh? Mm -hmm. For the alleged baggage he had carried with him to his new position. You will all recall that Piccoli was fired from the NPA because he refused to obey instructions from the then president, Abombeki, to lay off prosecuting National Police Commissioner Jackie Silebe for corruption. Sunday Times reports that, and I quote, his forensic skills were so highly prized and he was such a national hero that Gobodo had hunted him and trumpeted his appointment as the example of how highly her company valued all the good things auditing companies say they value, end of quote. Now, Sunday Times goes further to say that according to Piccoli, the ANC had told Gobodo that if she didn't get rid of him, she'd lose out on government contracts. And although Gobodo denies that they were ever put under pressure to fire Piccoli, their response, their response to me points to the isolation I'm talking about. I quote, we bailed out, this is the Gobodo representative talking, we bailed out because we were, not, we were prepared to fight any other fight, but what we were not prepared to do was to fight Vusi Piccoli's battles. They continue, we are running business, a business here. You must go and fight it yourself because this is not an SNG battle, it is your battle. If, it's, if that is not being concerned to solitude, to loneliness, precisely because you stand for certain principles, then I don't know what to make of it. Now, we may never know why Vosif Koli was fired, although your guess is, good, is as good as mine. But I find this example apt because it is indicative of the collusion between business and the state to finger those who are deemed to be the enemy of the state and therefore lacking the kind of influence that business desires. Such men of integrity and honesty are doomed to internal exile in spite of their highly prized skills. It reminds us that even in what may appear to be a robust democracy such as South Africa, the trappings of the gleam are real and the need to build to hold public figures accountable remains a challenge to this nascent democracy. Tenderpreneurs and those hanging on their aprons just for a bottle of whiskey or a golden wristwatch, a pair of shoes, we've had those narratives, are an everyday reality threatening to tear apart the tender fabrics from which this new nation is stitched. Sadly, and this is the last point I want to make, the ruled, the so-called the people, are as implicated in their own oppression as much as their rulers. This is one of the deviations that Ama makes from Fanon's faith in the upward thrust of the people, to suggest that the people, the masses, are in a significant way perpetrators of their own slavery. The Cameroonian, the Cameroonian scholar, Achil Mbebe, has characterized the relationship between the ruled and the rulers as defined by illicit cohabitation and mutual zombification, a process through which they rob each other of any potency, even as those in power work to dispense patronage. It is a relationship defined by pretense. If you do not think that the space we are talking about is a space of skillful, fraudulent dealers, then think of those who until recently were engaged in, a, in the crazy dance around our own president not so long ago, and the speed with which they have changed the dance and the tune so soon. And so we hear them saying, pay back the money, pay back the money pay back the money. Oh, what happened? I thought they wanted to kill for him not so long ago. 
What has changed? That's the kind of market that one is talking about. The point is that that is how the moral economy of consumption works. It is like a market in which the dividing line between the auctioneer and the bidders are blurred. This political culture of consumption, though, should not be read purely as the so-called African corruption or some essentialized politics of the belly that I was referring to, as many have made, made us to, to believe. My point, which I want you to get, is that when a state fails its people, and yet it remains the main institution of economic advancement, this kind of behavior is expected. It is a culture born of the instrumenta instrumentalization of the state by the ruling elite, and therefore, access to the state can only be perceived in idioms of consumption. As early as 1966, the Ugandan poet Okot Bitek warned us of this culture of consumption in his extended poetry. And I want to quote this because these are not new things. He says, independence falls like a bull buffalo and the hunters rush to it with drawn knives sharp, shining knives for carving the carcass, and if your chest is small, bony and weak, they push you off. And if your knife is blunt, you get the dung on your elbow. You come home empty-handed, and the dogs bark at you. That is 1966, Okot Bitek, writing about the culture of eating and the conception of what independence means to the majority. Now the idea of independence as signaling the moment of eating or a feast in which only those with knives, often meaning the right connections in the state corridors, get the spoils of the nation, has dominated African literature for decades. The literature suggests that the idea remains so secured in the psyche of many Africans that it is difficult to think of state power and ignore its strong association with eating. Uhuru may mean political freedom, but it only requires real meaning when it translates into eating and proper carving of the national cake as the parlance goes. There is never any talk about freedom to produce, to work, to be creative in building wealth of the nation. Instead, the culture of eating is either treated with indifference or tacit approval. But this tacit approval by the people of eating is neither an illusion or a false class consciousness. Studies now show that it is ready access to state institutions in Africa that really makes classes or signal groups dominance. The state is not only an effective instrument of control, of control and class struggle, it is also quite adaptable in ensuring any form of domination. It is not surprising that a number of African leaders have found the organizational structure of the state perfectly suitable for all forms of domination, including ethnic domination in a number of places. The distribution of the state resources is often done through the big men and big sisters connected to the state power. The big men dispense patronage, or rather, patronage is dispensed through them rather than directly to the people. So what it means is that closeness, closeness to those with power, wealth, and influence becomes important. In a context such as this, such as this one, ordinary people are often convinced that they can access power and wealth through the big man or woman quite often meaning homeboy, kinsman, etc., etc. Where the Africa, where does Africa go from here? Although this novel, and I'm ending, although this novel focuses to a large extent on rottenness and decay, there are also suggestions of rebirth. This is a very strong philosophical position embedded in the novel, particularly through its imagery, which is associated with the cycles of nature. 
decay and renewal as we are reminded that yet out of the decay and the dung there's always a new flowering. The underlying philosophical principle of the text is that although the, be the beautiful ones are not yet born, there are always those possibilities. Possibilities embodied in man's capacity to change and for those giants of hope like the protagonist of the novel who have the ability to endure ridicule, resentment and self-doubt without giving in to a corrupt environment. It is such men that point to the possibility of breaking the cyclic mode that we are often trapped in as human beings. As Ben Okri reminds us, the challenge to all human civilizations is to break its own cyclicity. And that is what art, at its most supreme state, strives to do. In this sense, it is important to remember that the nation building or building of a human civilization is never a very easy task, as we tend to think. It is both protracted and challenging, always calling us, calling upon us, and I quote Ben Okri again, to break the matrix of life as we know it, to create something new, simply because the human in us compels us at our very best to go beyond ourselves in search of that elusive freedom. Therein lies Africa's hope. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm sure that you will join me in once again thank you, Professor Gude, for this very bold and, and provocative presentation. I'm sure that there are going to be many questions, and I will, I will field one or two of them uh, before we are going to, to adjourn. Um, once again, ladies and gentlemen, let's thank Professor Gude for that provocative <laughs> And now, as indicated, there, we have time for two or three questions. Thank you. I enjoyed your presentation very much. I'd like to ask you, uh, how has Africa succeeded in corrupting democracy? Uh, once a, a party is in power, they never get out. They never get voted out, regardless of whether the people are aware of all these things. Uh, how was that possible? That they hold up we are a democratic government if we know there are lots of people there. Okay. Professor Gure, I'll take the full three and then we'll respond to all three of them. We've got a question right at the back, Dr. Umar. Professor Gure, how would Amma respond to the notion that corruption is not an African notion? Thank you. Thank you for the mind awakening uh, speech and the presentation. And I think this is what we need to engage on. However, my issue is, is that there is a book by Walter Rudy that talks about how Europe underdeveloped Africa. Is it not maybe the corruption that we see, the decay of our liberation, is a manifestation of that? Thank you. You have taken us through what, what I consider to be the challenges of Africa, uh, the, of African governments, uh, pre-colonial African governments. Now, what would be your constructive proposal, given where we are today? Constructive proposal. From where we are today, what we need to be doing, because the writers Paint, paint um, a picture of Africa in its evolution up to this point. We can't continue to lament. What are the things we must do to create a new nation? Thank you. I think those are fairly important questions. I don't pretend that I have uh, answers, you know, uh, for all of them. One of the mistakes that we must never make as scholars is to think that we have answers. I think. Uh, my role as a scholar is basically to attempt to explain and to understand uh, 
and, 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 and in certain ways, you know, once I can explain, that explanation can be taken up, you know, uh, by uh, other people. How has Africa managed to corrupt or to sustain, you know, uh, corruption? Um, now, I think part of what I was trying to sketch out was to draw our attention to a culture, uh, a culture that was embodied by the African elite. And, and this culture, in certain ways, I think, is a function of poverty, you know. Uh, is a function of poverty uh, in the sense that you get an elite that takes over power, and once they have taken over power, they use the political base as a resource. I've always I've written elsewhere that it is only in Africa where politics determines the economics and not the other way around. In other places, economics determine the politics. And that's why the state, in spite of what we think of it, many people think that the state in Africa is weak. My own assessment of the state and the way it has been constructed and used by the political elite is such that it is so effective, is so effective in providing these people with a control, the control over the resources. And in the process, in the process, you find that it is the actors, the main actors in the state that can distribute the legacy, you know, can distribute, you know, the wealth, can dispense, you know, patronage, you know, as they wish. And once you start doing that, it becomes a culture. But when you're also dealing with poor people, and I don't blame people sometimes, when you're dealing with poor people, you see that as, you know, the only way through which you can access economic resources is by moving closer to the state. One of the things that we have not fully theorized in Africa is the idea of the nation. And I think Mamdani has written a very interesting, uh, you know, um, made a very interesting point, that the idea of the nation remains a very distant thing in the minds of Africa, of Africans, or the subjects. We see ourselves largely as subjects and not citizens. And the reason for that has its roots in the colonial structure. The colonial structure was constructed such that the nation or the state resided somewhere in the capital. For example, most people think that South Africa, South Africa is in Pretoria. It is in Cape Town. It is in Johannesburg. So the, the state is right out there. How do you bridge the gap between the people who are living in the outlying areas and make them feel that they are part, they have a stake in the nation? And quite often, if you want to understand ethnicity, it is precisely because people have no strong feelings about the nation. They have strong feelings about their communities, local communities. That's why when you have corruption in local communities, you see them rioting. But when the corruption is out there, no, it's not part of us. It is precisely because the nation has not crystallized in the minds of most people. And in certain way, it is a legacy of colonialism. That's the way, you know, that, that I look at it. And because of that, the, the political elite has exploited that, has exploited that gap. And quite often, they play our people against the other. That group is eating. It is now our turn to eat. And it works. I will do the same. You know, people think that ethnicity does not pay. It does. We've seen it. We've seen when an ethnic group takes over and begins to reward its people, it's done so crudely that you would be a fool to think that ethnic patronage does not work. It does. That doesn't make it good, but it does work. So they exploit that. And until we're able to break that cycle, I don't know how, 
But until we're able to break that cycle, we'll not be in a position um, to deal with uh, a number of shortcomings in Africa. Corruption is not an African thing. Well, I don't suggest that corruption is an African thing. I don't think, am I suggesting that it is an, it's, it's an African thing? And uh, Gerald, um, you know, one of the things that I don't like about us is that sometimes we, we become very defensive. Uh, when we are engaging with the rotten underbelly of our societies, then we say, but it is not just us. That's not good enough. It's, you know, this culture is not just us. The other one, because the other one is eating, I must also eat. I don't think that's the right logic. Because the French were involved in the arms deal, so that makes it good. Really, does it? Does it? My concern is about what is happening to us, how we get affected by the phenomenon of corruption. But indeed, I agree with you, it is not, it's not an African thing. One of the biggest problems that I have in Africa is that when we engage in corruption, it's so personalized that it never touches the ordinary people. I'm not saying that corruption to, should you know, benefit everybody else, but I, I would be a lot more comfortable if somebody took money from uh, some arms deal and built a clinic in his, in his home area. I'd be a lot more comfortable with that. But when you take it for yourself, I think there's something stinking about it, something revolting, as Amma says. That's my worry. But I agree that corruption is not, it's not an African thing. Um, that doesn't stop us from dealing with our problems. How Europe underdeveloped Africa? Yes, um, I read Walter Rodney as early as my second year. That was our Bible. And with the quality of research that Walter Rodney brought to bear in that book, you know, one cannot, and I hope I was not suggesting that, you know, um, Africa's problem has nothing to do with the legacy of colonialism. Of course it does. It, does, it has something to do with the legacy of colonialism. As, you know, um, the plundering of resources that took place. The legacy of slave trade that, you know, um, Walter Rodney talks about in great details. All those impoverished Africa in many ways. But having said that, having said that, some critics have said that colonialism was not a one bandited phenomenon as Walter Rodney makes it look like. The point I'm making is that one of the things that Africans were able to do, one of the questions that we need to be asking, what did Africans do with colonialism? We never ask that question you know, enough. How did they turn colonialism around to change their own situation? And in certain ways they did. They used, we would not be having independence if it was not for the fact that the first nationalist used colonial education, turned it around and used it to liberate or to be the brokers, the political brokers of the continent. But I have a problem when people constantly look over their shoulder and say, oh, we have problems here, but it is those people. It's the imperialists. It's that and that. What are you doing? What is the internal political agency? That is my concern as a people. What interventions do you make as a people? That is what will save Africa. It is not mourning. You know? Grief may overcome you, but grief will not help you. It's, it's very easy to sit back and mourn and blame everybody else. Africa is not the only country, continent that was colonized. There are many that were colonized, you know. But they don't just sit back mourning. They confront some of these problems. And I think we need to do that. Um, 
what constructive proposal? That question always comes up. You know, you intellectuals, you just make noise. What alternatives do you have? Mm. Um, to, be, to be fair, I don't have answers. These are very big problems, my brother. I don't have, you know, answers. I believe that part of the answer lies in understanding our situation. If you don't understand, you cannot propose alternatives. So for me as a scholar, it is first and foremost, my responsibility is to explain, to help us understand where the rain began to beat us, what mistakes we are making. And I'm not by any chance suggesting that the answers to these problems are easy. They are not. That's why in the end I'm saying that nation building is a protracted process. You know, I always wonder, I always wonder why we get so frustrated. I was telling my fellow Kenyans that, did you know that Kenya is just 50 years old? This thing was just recently crafted by the British, you know? And we want one Kenya, one this, 50 years old. It has not even reached retirement age. Hmm? It has not, you know? Do you know how long it took America, and I'm not saying you should take that long, 100 years, 100 years to build a constructive democracy. But that is no reason why we should sit back and say, ah, you know, it took them that long, you know. So we can continue in our corruption, we can t continue with um, uh, our greed, we can t continue with this excess. The awareness that the process is protracted, the process is a difficult one, is important so that we don't get into a dreamland, okay? And that's the point that I was, trying, I was trying to make, that we need to be aware that it's a difficult, but we have to deal with some of this. The moment we deal with some of these problems of corruption, the moment we, we accept dissent, that's why I was giving the examples of Madoncella and Vusi Piccoli. People, you may not agree with me, that's fine, but the point I was making, that when we start by silencing, those who provide critique to the state, then we are undermining democracy. Then we are undermining the possibilities of rebirth. And that's why Ama says, the only way we can achieve rebirth, rebirth is through evacuation. The evacuation of the faith, the evacuation of the things that hold us back. That is all I can say as a literary scholar. I do not have ready answers. These tasks are huge. Mm. Once again, thank you, Professor Gude. Ladies and gentlemen, we have now reached the end of this evening's proceedings. It remains for me now to thank a number of people. Firstly, of course, I have to thank the Vice Chancellor and Principal in our absence for having initiated the UP Expert Lecture Series. This was the 15th in, in the series. Um, and like the, the previous one, Professor Gude, it was extremely stimulating. The UP um, Expert Lecture Series are, are designed to, to allow or to provide a podium for some of the finest minds at the University of Pretoria. And this evening, we had an invitation or an illustration of that. Secondly, I want to obviously thank Professor James Ogude for his um, um, UP expert lecture this evening for doing the 15th lecture for us. As I've indicated um, earlier, it was a very bold lecture, um, a very provocative lecture. At one point, one could, I uh, suppose, when one listened to part of the lecture, one wanted to weep with despair at, at the picture that was portrayed. But in the description and the analysis, we found, I suppose, some, some reason for, for hope, because there's always hope where, there, where there's critique, as Professor Gude indicated in his presentation, that when we have to provide critique, there can be estrangement, and that, for me, would be the glimmer of first hope, the first glimmer of hope. And Professor Gude, coming from the humanities, myself, I would like to thank you for, uh, for providing such a resounding presence for the humanities in the UP uh, lecture series. Then, too, obviously, I have to thank the Center for the Advancement of Scholarship, where Professor Gude is currently based. I think the center had, had organized the publication of the, of the brochure which we had here this evening.
Fourth, I need to thank uh, Mr. Lynette Smith and Linda van Weyck and Professor Denver Hendricks of the Department of University Relations for having organized the entire event. And they've organized it as superbly as what they've organized all the other lectures um, in the series. Thank you, Professor um, Hendricks and, and your, your colleagues. I also want to thank the rest of the colleagues in the Department uh, of University Relations for assisting in the organizing of this evening's event. And then, of course, I want to thank the dictators for the refreshments that will be served after the event. And lastly, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for, for being um, an attentive audience, but also an audience that was willing to, to I suppose, respond to the issues that were placed um, um, in front of us. Because that is what the essence of these lectures, what the intention of these lectures is. We have provocative uh, presentations, we have thought-inspiring presentations, and we need an audience in, that can engage with, with the lectures that are, are, are presented. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and I do believe that the last round of applause um, is for you. Thank you.